it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Or you can tow. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about toke on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Portland, Oregon, at Rolla J Studios. Plus your calls live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy poop dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. How is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and and the, the next thing you know, they got ten years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Ganja graphics, the Sultan of Sativa statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical Russ Belleville. Welcome, welcome, everyone. It's time for Toker Talk Radio. It's Tuesday, July 30th. So glad to have you here. Got a lot of stories in the hopper to talk about today, and a few of them make me kind of mad. So if you're looking for the uh, happy, good time bong smoking show, this probably won't be that episode. There's times for that. There's, There's a time and a place for the happy, good time bong smoking show. I'm not against that. I'm just saying there's some serious stuff going on here in the drug war and some stuff that really makes me mad. And I hope that when it makes you mad that you take that energy and you direct it toward changing these laws, toward getting involved, toward getting off the couch, toward putting your feet in the streets, toward meeting other people, toward banding together, toward calling your elected officials, toward writing a letter, toward sponsoring an initiative petition if you have that in your state. Don't get mad, get even. We're going to get even by changing these laws. So here's one I wanted to talk about. I got this off of Huffington Post, and uh, it's pretty relevant to me because, you know, one of the things that I really, really rail against here is this kinder, gentler drug war. This idea now, this third way that the drug warriors realize that only 7% of the American people support the concept of the war on drugs. So now their idea is to reframe things. Oh, no, no, we're all about this for treatment and prevention. We want to help people. We want to get people the treatment they need. We can't arrest our way out of this problem. They need treatment. Well, yeah, I, I, I concur if those people want treatment, if those people seek treatment. But when you're busting them for merely having drugs and then forcing them into treatment, then you are serving uh, the criminal justice system. Using the criminal justice system to try to solve what are essentially health problems is going to have some serious negative repercussions, some unintended consequences that you never planned for. And this is one of them. A woman named Elaine Palowski is writing in Huffington Post reevaluating drug courts. No mother should have to go through what I did. She's talking about her son who was a drug addict. I don't know if it was heroin, I think. And um, because of his convictions and because of his drug treatment, he died when he could have been saved. She writes, we know much of the dilemma my son faced on his last day from the information in his apartment. We know that he was in a crisis situation. We know that he could not present himself to the emergency room without breaking his probation. We know that the state's 911 Good Samaritan law wouldn't have protected him because he was already involved with the criminal justice system. On the day he died, he didn't go to the hospital for a relapse, as we practice time and time again. He did not call 911 as he had before. He passed away in his home in Manhattan, even though he lived one block away from Lenox Hill Hospital. 
Why didn't my son seek help? In 2010, my son was convicted of a drunken driving offense. As the lawyers recommended, he was put into New York's drug treatment court. That would change his life forever. District attorneys are allowed to snicker and demean participants that have the chronic illness of addiction, and the judge did nothing to stop their behavior. The peanut gallery is allowed to sneer and giggle as judges reprimand young people, bullying participants, and playing cat and mouse games to teach a lesson. Not only are participants berated and shamed in a public forum, but family members are publicly humiliated and demeaned for their support of their own child's partner or spouse. The atmosphere undermines trust in the process. Once he entered the drug court program, he had no control or choice over his medical care. My son lived under the constant threat of incarceration and was remanded to jail for relapses, further impairing his ability to get help for his mental illness. He didn't even have the privacy to talk to his doctors without the threat that what they say may be used against them, again impeding his success. You know, I'm going to pick on conservatives for a second. So sorry if you're conservative. And and maybe this if you're listening to this show, this doesn't apply to you. But I hear this from conservatives a lot when they're passing these laws for drug courts and they're passing these laws. And their point is often that we're going to do this for their own good. We're going to get them the help they need. We're going to get them the rehab they need. And this seems to be coming from the same people who oppose some sort of public option health care because we don't want the government to get in between the doctor and the patient. I don't want the government making the choices for me. But it seems if the illness is addiction and addiction's been defined as a crime, then you're fine with the government getting involved in the health care. You seem to be fine with the government mandating which choices the person makes to treat their addiction. And addiction's got to be the only disease where a relapse can land you in jail. Talk more about this when we come back. And take your calls, too. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business, you know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business, you know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Sunburn and Cypress there with Reefer Slackness. Some of our Electric Tuesday music. Welcome back. Toker Talk Radio here. 
It's 4.10 here in the Pacific Time Zone. And we're glad you could join us here on Toker Talk Radio. We've got the uh, phone lines open at 971-533-7111 if you want to get involved here. If you've had any experience with the drug court system that's been a part of your life and you have any experience would like to share with our audience, the lines are open at 971-533-7111. I've been pretty fortunate not have to experience anything like that, but everybody I know who has experienced such a thing has told me what a waste of time it is. And of course, people I'm talking to are people who have gone to rehabs for marijuana. And as we all know, that's a huge waste of time and resources. And it's something I wish I would have um, had more time to address uh, back there in Minnesota. Uh, During that panel uh, in St. Paul that was uh, featured uh, uh, Sir Richard Branson, the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota, Chris Coleman, made a comment that Minnesota is the land of 10,000 rehabs. And he pointed out how Hazelden, one of the leading rehab corporations, was formed in Minnesota and kind of you know, started the whole trend. They were one of the first ones to, you know, really make a a business model out of it. So I'd have wished I'd had more time with Sir Richard to to be able to pose a question because he kind of danced around it a little bit in the in the post um, in the panel how marijuana legalization or decriminalization is something that should be done first and foremost, and then the whole rest of the agenda of the Global Commission on Drugs. Uh, as far as legalization of of drugs should then be addressed. And I really wish I, I would have gotten around to a question about, do you find you know marijuana to be something that's not really even in the same discussion as these other drugs? We find it at least in the in the polls, right? You ask people if marijuana should be legal, we're getting above fifty percent. You ask him any other drug, you don't even break ten percent. Not even mushrooms ecstasy, cocaine, anything like that doesn't even break 10%. So on the public's mind, it's a different debate for sure. And the other part of the debate that I think needs to be addressed is the whole market part of it. And this is where I think we need to start hitting on Kevin Sabet and the prohibitionists and this third way kinder gentler drug war is they completely ignore the manufacturing, trafficking, and sales aspect. Well, I shouldn't say that. They pay attention to it in not wanting legalization because there'll be big marijuana. But this whole kind or gentler thing of, oh, we shouldn't lock up people, and, and a lot of this breaking the taboo stuff was, you know, oh, it's an addiction, and this this last story I told you about the drug courts, the woman's son's addicted, he can't call 911 because he's on probation, and that'll violate his probation, so it's better off he overdoses and dies. All those stories focus on the end user. And in the case of the hard drugs, focus on the addict. But if we're going to have a serious discussion about this, we need to recognize a few things. And one of them is some people can do drugs and do them just fine. And it doesn't cause harmful outcomes in their life. I know people that do cocaine. Not all the time. They get together for a party. Somebody's got some cocaine, they do it. I know people that do meth every now and then, every six months or so, big meth binge. I know people that do acid and do mushrooms on a somewhat regular basis. And it doesn't seem to be impacting their lives. They seem to be going about it and using them responsibly. Now, they may use them more than some of us would or some of us would like. But I know people that got all sorts of hobbies that are pretty intense into it. Right? I know people that skydive. I know people that are Civil War reenactors. Hey, if you're having fun, if you're enjoying yourself, you're doing it responsibly and taking the appropriate precautions to ensure that nobody else is going to be uh, adversely impacted by your hobby, have at it. And whether that's, you know, dressing up Confederate and playing around with muskets or it's doing some cocaine at a party at your private house, knock yourself out. We're going to have to recognize that recreational drug use exists and there it's not a moral failing. It's not a moral failing any more than the people who enjoy going out to have a beer at the ball game, have a whiskey at the bar, have some wine at dinner. 
It's a personal choice some people make, and if they make it responsibly and exercise it responsibly, there's no more reason to criminalize that, cocaine, heroin, meth, than it is to criminalize alcohol because some people become alcoholics. We provide treatment for the alcoholics. We provide all sorts of laws against alcoholic behavior that endangers others. Drunk driving comes to mind. But we allow alcohol, and we we presume that most people using it are using it recreationally and safely. Use responsibly. Drink responsibly, right? We see that all the time. And if we're going to have a serious discussion about drugs in this country, then the other side's going to have to recognize that just like some people can drink and a few people can't, some people can do drugs and a few people can't. And that freaks people out to hear that. <laughs> freaks a lot of people out to hear that, but it's true. And that's where I want to come back to this drug court story with the the mom losing her son because he can't call nine one one. There's a there's a nine one. There's such a thing as a nine one one Good Samaritan law in New York. A few other states have it. Some universities have it. Cities have it. Where if someone's overdosing and you call nine one one, you can't be prosecuted for possession or anyone there for possession that led to the overdose, right? And this seems to make sense, right? A person shouldn't have to decide, ah, should I let my friend die or should I get busted for the for the weed in my closet? Nobody should have to make that choice. But this guy did because he was already in the criminal justice system. The 911 Good Samaritan Law only applies to people that aren't on probation or parole. You're on probation or parole, any contact with the weed, with the drugs of any kind, is means to revoke your probation or parole and put you back in a cage. So those people, the people who most need a 911 Good Samaritan law, people who are addicted and prone to relapse, do you know, here's a little aside, by the way, drug addiction has lower success rates in clinical treatment than a lot of cancers do. You get testicular cancer, you're far more likely to recover and never have a relapse of cancer with clinical treatment than if you are addicted to methamphetamine. Wow. And so given, I mean, imagine if a cancer patient could be, all right, well, we'll give you this treatment for cancer. But if your cancer comes back, we're putting you in a cage. Like, so the guy's feeling around. He feels a lump. You think he's going to call? Well, I mean, maybe that's not a lump. I don't want to go to jail. I, <laughs> we would never treat any other disease like that. But for some reason, these kinder, gentler drug warriors see no insanity in treating drug use like that. Because, again... Despite all their hype, despite all their talk about wanting to be compassionate and wanting to give treatment for the poor sick people that need it, they don't see it as a sickness. They see it as a moral failing. They see it as a moral failing and they see drug rehabilitation not as a medical procedure, not as a psychiatric assistance, but as a moral cleansing. And if you're not bowing down to the moral cleansing and the mental brainwashing that's what they think you're doing. They think when you relapse, it's not because you're addicted to a drug. <laughs> no, it's because you, oh, well, see, we gave you the way out. We here, us good folks here, we decided not to put you in a cage and we gave you a drug court and we gave you a treatment, but you're just not responding to the treatment because of your own lack of willpower or whatever it might be. So now we need to put you in the cage. That's the way they see this. And that's why I shudder every time I see a Matthew Perry or I see one of these politicians up there crowing about drug courts and drug court successes. You know, do I prefer a drug court over throwing people in a prison? Well, yeah, sure. Just as I oppose being whipped with a lash to an electrocution. But I don't want either, okay? If you're forcing me to make the choice, okay, I'll take the whipping, Compared to the electrocution, okay. But drug courts are not the answer. The answer lies in recognizing drugs for what they are instead of the moral picture they've been drawn into.
All right, so we got to take a break. It's 20 after 420 here in the Pacific Time Zone, where weed is legal just to the north of me, quasi-legal just to the south of me, medically legal where I'm at. Oh, have you ever met oh and good news, Left Wing Larry gets his patient card tomorrow, which means I get my caregiver card tomorrow. Which means Rolla J Studios and the Buckin' Bronco House are legal for up to a pound and a half of marijuana and 24 plants. Woohoo! I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Since medical marijuana became legal in Colorado, Marisol Therapeutics has been one of the most successful dispensaries in the state. Caring for thousands of patients, Marisol produces terrific medicine in their greenhouses and in their outdoor gardens. Here's Michael Stetler, the director of Marisol Therapeutics. Uh, this is our go. We handle probably over 1,500 patients. We're licensed by the state of Colorado, and we try to do things the proper way. Different patients need different uh, strains for different ailments. It's really hard for us to grow this medicine and have the federal government say this and, and people out there in the everyday life not understand what this medicine's about. God wouldn't give us an herb like this for it to be the devil's plant, what they say, and that's wrong. This is an angel's plant. This is, does good for human beings. It's never killed nobody in its entire existence. It's time that we quit uh, witch hunting this plant and you know we take it into our knowledge and do good like the fathers did. Bless this plant and let that plant teach us. Back everybody, 24 after here. That's the accused with scared of the dark. It's 710 here. I know it was just 420. It, it, it went from 420 to 710 in lightning speed. In fact, I'm gonna have to turn my pin over now. There we go. Oh, there we go, 710. Welcome back. It's the West Belleville Show, Toker Talk Radio. We're just hanging out here on a nice Tuesday. Tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow I get my caregiver card. Well, not really. Uh, tomorrow, Larry gets his appointment and gets his recommendation and takes it to the state, which then stamps his paperwork. 
right? And from that moment, once the paperwork is stamped, you're a legal patient. And once the, that, once he's a legal patient, I'm a legal caregiver. So we're protected under the law. But it'll take a few months. Usually it takes three months before you get a card. A few weeks, actually. Uh, 12 weeks or so uh, before the card arrives. And what's nice is when the card, when they print the card, they don't stamp it with the date that you got your paperwork turned in. They stamp it with the date they make the card. Follow me? So we're going to turn this card in here uh, July 31st. Let's just call it August 1st. We're going to get into the state at August 1st. If they don't get us a card until, say, October 1st, maybe even November 1st, then the card expires a year from November or a year from October. So a card that you're paying 200 bucks for for 12 months really turns out to be like 15 on that first year. You get like those first three months free because they don't actually have a card to you, but you're still legal. And all of the uh, uh, safe access points around here, the MWIOs, will take your stamped paperwork for admittance. And we've got one that's just a block away from us. I kid you not, walk out my door, walk four houses up to Sandy and up a block, and there is on a little, one of those little flat iron, you know, those little triangle wedge kind of streets, a single little building called Flower to the People. <laughs> Flower to the people. That's right. We have our own little neighborhood dispensary we can walk to. And just a block away in the other direction, there's a little market that sells lots of butane. They got boxes and boxes of butane. I can't imagine why. And glass and all sorts of good stuff. So we've got ourselves a good location. And this weekend, we just might have to have us a housewarming party. That would be fun. All right. Let me go back to the news for a second. There was a story, uh, some hemp stories that I wanted to get to that are nice to see. We're getting more and more recognition of industrial hemp. Gizmodo has a story on this super cool scooter is made from hemp? Question mark. All right. Let me see if I can get a, a video shot of this. I'll get this on the screen for those of you watching uh, on the replays. And of course, now you wouldn't give me it. There's what I'm looking for. Thank you. So here's the scooter, right? Little electric scooter. You can see it plugged into the wall there and a little windshield and everything. But it's a one piece design with little tiny scooter wheels and it's made from hemp. Uh, it goes uh, zero to 30 in seven seconds. <laughs> okay, it's an electric scooter, guys. Give it a break, right? Zero to 30 in uh, seven seconds. It has a 50 mile range. And made from hemp. I mean, aside from the plexiglass windshield and the metal on the windshield, you know, but the body, the frame, right, is made of hemp. Uh, its sleek look belie the fact that this two-wheeled runaround is made from the hippest of materials, hemp and flax fibers bound together with a biologically derived resin. It's perfectly strong enough to survive the city and wins environmentally friendly brownie points as well. Very cool. Let's go to our phone call here. We got a caller coming in from right here in Oregon. You're on the line with Toker Talk Radio. Good afternoon, Russ. What's up? It's kind of funny. Hi, how are you, dude? You're talking about the, uh, the card thing and, and making up time. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've been a card holder since, well, uh, my fourth one was three digits, so way early on. But nonetheless, um, then there was slow and subjecting about getting the card to you. And yes, it was stamped when it was printed. Yeah. Well, in the last couple of years, they've been lickety split about it. Oh, really? Like 30, 30 days, dude. Wow. I can, you can set your watch by it. <laughs> so, so is it like the, the, all the money that they, they ripped off of us by jacking the fees up from 100 to 200, they put it towards some more clerks or something? Well, yeah. And plus to close the, uh, the window. There's no window anymore. It's yeah. all mail. They got to make more money, man. They can't give us three months for free. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 Turn that bad. No. Well, yeah. I think the last card I got was, um, well, it's probably in my wallet somewhere, but like around the yeah. end of 2010, I think. So that could be right. right. Maybe they sped up in a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know the last, my last two uh, renewals, like 30 days, man. Wow. Like, right, Leave it right to on. government to get more efficient when there's some money at stake, huh? 
Well, yeah. To That's rip off of patience, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Let me see. All right, so I'm looking at my cards here. I got one that expired in... Oh, and I got one that expired in 2012. Yeah, that expired of April of 2012, so I've had them for a while. Yeah. I got a card going back to uh, 2007. Yeah, here's... So check it out. It's like... Because I was doing... Originally, these were renewals, right? So they'd come up right at the same date. So my first card, March of 07... My second card, December of 09. So somewhere along the line, I got six months free there. And then from yeah. December of 2010 to May. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Let's back that up. I had them out of order. Stoner. See, this is why I don't do dabs during the show. Um, <laughs> let's see. Okay. So, um, yeah. So March of 07 to March of 08, I had a card. Did The next card got renewed May late May, like May 29th of 08. Yeah. So that's where it took him like two months that expired yeah. in May of 09. My next card was in December of 09. So that's where it took him like seven months to get a card to me. And then that expired mm -hmm. December, 2010. I got my next card, April of 2011. So it took four months. So yeah. Right. Hmm. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's win-win either way, right? If, if they don't well, get it to me know, soon, uh, either way, it's, it's, uh, you pick up not quite a month. Yeah. You do pick up some time. So it's a baker's dozen we get, right? Yeah. <laughs> In one yeah, month. Yeah. Get your Oregon medical marijuana card. Your first month is free. We got 13 months for the price of 12. That's right. 13 for the price of 12. Get it now. <laughs> Come buy some fine Oregon homegrown marijuana. It doesn't matter where you're from. Get your Oregon medical marijuana card today. Every state and all. No doubt. Well, hey, thanks for that update, yeah. man. I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right on. Yeah. Hey, where are you coming, call, calling from in Oregon? Or, uh, Dallas. Oh, right on. Dallas, Oregon. All right, man. Well, take yeah, care sure. and thanks for calling in and uh, we'll talk to you again sometime. Sure, Russ. Take all care, right. dude. Bye bye. See you later. All right. Yeah. So um, I guess I don't get my free three months, man. My free two months. Oh, well, we'll, we'll cope with that. Uh, anyway, back to the hemp scooter. I wanted to talk about this. Um, these uh, are lightweight uh, because of the hemp uh, and flax combination and much, much lighter material for them to make. Um, the two part outer shell supports the entire vehicle, uh, houses the drivetrain and the rest of the bike hangs off of it. And they're going to be rental bikes. They're going to be rental scooters uh, that they put in various places in Europe. So that's pretty cool. And then a follow up on that. Um, Story coming out of Quartz.com, Bloomberg as well uh, made note of this. Hemp is used in over 25,000 products, now including BMWs. And uh, the i3 is a new BMW electric car. And Bloomberg notes that the car maker will line the door panels with hemp. And they just briefly kind of mention it. But uh, these are significant developments for these automakers, especially as they move into making uh, electric vehicles and the mandate to, to get our uh, gas mileage up to, what is it, 50 miles a gallon? Something, you know, big number up there. We're trying to finally do something serious about mandating emissions, mandating, you know, better gas mileage. They need to have lighter, stronger materials. And there's no material out there that can do more bang for the buck, give you better environmentally friendly production and provide better tensile strength and, and look and appearance and, and moldability than what you can get from hemp. And these European automakers, BMWs figured it out and it's easy and economic for them because you can actually grow hemp in Germany. You can actually grow hemp in lots of Europe. Why are we crippling our U S automakers from being able to address this huge consumer need and to be able to benefit from saying, hey, you know, the stuff that we plant to make our door panels actually sucks in carbon dioxide and replenishes the soil. No, no, we can't because hemp, uh, it looks like marijuana and people smoke it and get high. So obviously we can't use that. When, you, when you've done this long enough, when we look at the drug war in ways like that, uh, there's a point, you know, when you first get involved in this active, you get really pissed off. Oh, you get so mad. And I still do from time to time. But there's a point at which it just becomes tragically absurd. It's like, who wrote this script? It's awful. <laughs> How, really? We're going to not plant hemp and benefit it from it in all the ways we can benefit because some people smoke pot and get high from it. And no matter how many times you tell them, 
hemp looks different than pot. It's planted different than pot. It doesn't get you high like pot. You can't hide pot with hemp. No matter how many times you show them the facts, the United States can't get around it because it the, the thing it most cannot do, the U.S. government, that is, the number one thing it cannot do in this debate is admit there's something good about marijuana. The more I analyze it, the more it just comes down to that. It's a face-saving thing. They can't admit they're wrong. They can't admit they've been lying about it. And that's what becomes the most frustrating part of this battle of all, is when you start to realize that even they know it. Even they know it. You talk to these cops, you talk to these prosecutors, we know we're not really making a dent in the war. We know that capturing this leader of Los Zetas cartel just means someone else will take over for Los Zetas cartel. We know we're only capturing a fraction of what comes into the borders. We know, we know, we know. Well, then stop it. Just stop. If you know, just stop. And it becomes more and more frustrating when you realize that they just can't. And, and the longer I cover this, the more it seems they're talking about us is merely projection of themselves. It's a projection of their weaknesses and their addictions, their addiction to this drug war. The moral judgments they cast upon us are the moral judgments they cast upon themselves. And we are just their scapegoats. We just stand in for the moral discussion they can't have with themselves. Oh, yeah. But hemp is going to break through with this. I know it is. It's just becoming economically impossible for it not to. We talk about hempcrete. Talk about car parts so much and the food nutrition oh hey we'll talk about more of that when we come back we'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the russ belleville show you're tuned into the russ belleville show the voice of the marijuana nation Have you considered medical marijuana? Double-blind, peer-reviewed studies have found cannabinoid therapies to be successful in treating the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, brain cancer, chronic pain, diabetes mellitus, dystonia, fibromyalgia, GI disorders, hepatitis C, HIV AIDS, hypertension, incontinence, MRSA, multiple sclerosis, osteoporosis, pruritus, rheumatoid arthritis, sleep apnea, and Tourette's syndrome as well as anecdotal evidence in suggesting relief from anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress, plus reduction in the need for narcotic painkillers. Side effects from medical marijuana can include euphoria, relaxation, anxiety, panic reaction, paranoia, tachycardia, dry eyes, dry mouth, concentration, and reaction time impairments, appetite increase, and in some U.S. states, arrest and incarceration. But medical marijuana is non-toxic and cannot cause overdose. Medical marijuana, it's not for everyone, but ask your doctor if medical marijuana may be right for you. Fun, fun, fun. Big Daddy Things. Funky Rollerade.
Maybe lunch isn't exactly. Big Chief 2. You hear that kind of rock and more on the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour every Friday night, 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Replayed on Saturday nights as well. Herb Thrasher and I bring you an eclectic mix of metal and hellbilly. If they play guitar fast, it's on the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour. It does make for an interesting mix, I gotta tell you that. Welcome back. You're listening to Toker Talk Radio on 420radio.org. You can visit our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Radical Russ, where we've got all the information about the shows and downloads. And if you want to see the video replays of Toker Talk Radio, you need to become a VIP member of 420radio.org. That unlocks the secret pages where you can get your 420 Radio Toker Talk Radio replay. And you can see this cool thing. This is the Lotus Eco Elise, and it's a prototype car made by Lotus, and all the parts of this prototype car, except the solar roof panels, it's got solar roof panels, it makes its own energy, (laughs) are made from hemp. This interior here, you know, the, the little shifter thing there, handle, of course the steering wheel's on the other side, because this is a... European model, right? But yeah, the panels, the seats, amazing. And we're not letting our farmers grow this crop and letting our automakers make new, more efficient, more gas-friendly cars. And speaking of the gas-friendly, hell, slap a diesel engine in that thing and it can run on hemp. Henry Ford built a car made completely out of hemp. For the most part, you still got to have some parts that are metal and plastic and so on. But a lot of the plastics can be made from hemp now, too. And this is just seems like such a no brainer, you know, especially when you know that hemp is less than 0.3 percent THC. Less than 0.3 percent. Nothing you could do. Could make that get you high. I'll take that back. If you had an entire field of hemp and you could pack it all into one big vat and you could butane strip the entire thing and get oil off of it, maybe you could make something that would get you high. I don't think it would taste good. I don't think it'd work well. <laughs> I think the the time and energy it would take to make such a thing would not be worth it whatsoever. But I suppose it's possible. I'm not going to say never. You people are pretty uh, pretty damn uh, creative out there in <laughs> finding solutions for those things. But uh, that we deny our, our industry to be able to use hemp and our farmers to be able to grow it is just criminal and completely stupid. There's just no scientific or rational grounding in our philosophy of keeping both hemp and marijuana illegal. There's a lot of countries that grow hemp. Australia, Austria, Canada, Chile, China, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Great Britain, Hungary, India, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Poland, Romania, Russia, Slovenia, Spain, Switzerland, Turkey, Ukraine, Egypt, Korea, Portugal, Thailand. Now, you know what those countries also have in common? as well as growing hemp. Not one of them has legal marijuana. 
Now, I know the Netherlands within that list, you go, well, wait, wait, the Netherlands, they have coffee shops. No, those are just tolerated. It is still technically illegal to have marijuana, to possess it. But it is definitely illegal in the Netherlands to be cultivating it. All of these countries have very strict laws. Freaking China has some pretty strict laws against the cultivation of cannabis for drug purposes. And yet the cops and the feds, or whatever is the equivalent of the feds in their country, all seem to be able to understand that hemp is not that. They all seem to be able to understand and take quite advantage of being able to peddle their hemp wares to the American market. Because only in America are our cops so stupid they can't tell the difference between hemp and marijuana. Because they don't want to. They want to see a pot leaf, no matter what it's on, and bam, that means I can bust some hippies. That's what they want. I briefly mentioned the nutritional value of hemp. Check this out. This is from Hemp Industries Association. Hemp seed is nutritious and contains more essential fatty acids than any other source. Essential fatty acids more than any other source. Your omega-3s, your omega-6s, your omega-9s. The people are down in fish oil pills and belching and smelling like a carp all day. We got something that beats it. Hemp seed. And it's second only to soybeans in complete protein. However, hemp seed is more easily digestible by humans than soybeans are. So it may just be a better source for humans than soy. And hemp seed is high in B vitamins. It's a good source of dietary fiber. And yet, we're going to deny people this. Oh, no, I mean, you can have it. You can have hemp seed. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're buying it from Canada. As long as you're buying it from China. As long as no U.S. farmer made a, a living off of it, then, then it's okay to spend. As long as you're sending your money to Canada or China, you can eat all the hemp seed you want. Hemp produces more pulp per acre than timber on a sustainable basis and can be used for every quality of paper. Hemp paper manufacturing can reduce, can reduce wastewater contamination. Hemp's low lignin content reduces the need for acids used in pulping, and its creamy color lends itself to environmentally friendly bleaching instead of harsh chlorine compounds. Less bleaching results in less dioxin and fewer chemical byproducts. And let's not forget, and this isn't mentioned in that little point, but hemp paper is recyclable 10 times. Your standard wood pulp paper is recyclable twice. Five times more recyclable hemp paper is. In 1916, the government put out a study where they were all worried about this. They predicted by the 1940s that all paper would come from hemp and no more trees would need to be cut down. They were worried about that in 1916. Oh my God, we don't, maybe we ought not cut all these trees down for paper. And they had yet to invent the inkjet printer at that time. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things in, in computer history, by the way. People predicted the advent of the paperless office because everything would be digital and nobody would have to print anything. And yet what actually happened is printing and paper consumption went through the roof as everyone got their own printer. I digress. There's so much that we still have yet to explore here with hemp and what it can do. And that we're denied from doing so because we have such this moral indignation over the use of marijuana. That's the thing. That's the other thing that's frustrating about it too. I mean, as innocuous as, as hemp is the thing that, What's keeping it illegal is the demonization of the drug that, of all the recreational drugs, is the most innocuous, <laughs> you know? It'd be something else if, like, hemp came from the same source as heroin or meth, right? <laughs> well, we can't take a risk. My God, if we let all this hemp out, we'll have more meth heads. No, we're talking about pot, right? The drug that makes you, you know, laugh at stuff and eat donuts and, you know, what actually makes you dinner. If we, uh, you know, if the studies we have are, are showing us the accurate results here, and I think they are. 
But let's take a look at, I've got a video here on the hemp car, the Kestrel, that I think might be interesting. So I'll tell you what, we're gonna take a break. And when we come back from break, we'll learn a little bit more about hemp cars since we're on the hemp topic. You're listening to Toker Talk Radio on 420radio.org. You can subscribe to our podcast. Just go to 420radio.org, click the contact, or I'm sorry, connect with 420 Radio. The top panel will slide and reveal all our secrets to you. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Smoke a joint before trying this on. There you go, Ellen. You want to get high? We got some great high stick in the back. Smoke. Smoke? Kind buds. Sensing. You're going to love this stuff. It'll get you really high. Well, something old is new again. A new electric car made of hemp is being developed by a group of Canadian companies working in conjunction with the Canadian government. The Kestrel will be prototyped and tested this fall by Calgary-based Motive Industries Incorporated, a high-tech auto manufacturer. Now, this compact car, which seats four, will have a top speed of 90 kilometers or about 56 miles an hour and a range of up to 100 miles before needing to be recharged. The car's body will be made of an impact-resistant composite material produced from mats of, you guessed it, hemp. The hemp is also being grown in Canada. Now, Henry Ford was the first to build a car made of hemp fiber and resin back in the 1930s. That was more than half a century ago, but the idea wasn't developed much further as cannabis prohibition went into effect in 1937 and car manufacturers favored other materials such as steel. But in the last 25 years, fiberglass and carbon fiber based composites have gained popularity as materials for automobiles because they are strong and lighter weight. But producing composites from glass or carbon requires intense heat and multiple chemical processes, making them very energy intensive. In contrast, plant-based fibers like hemp is grown in a field using only the energy of the sun. As a structural material, hemp is about twice the strength of other plant fibers. It doesn't require much water or pesticide, and it also produces a high yield and grows well in Canada. Nathan Armstrong, president of Motive Industries Incorporated, adds, and I quote, It's illegal to grow cannabis in the U.S., so it actually gives Canada a bit of a market advantage, end quote. The U.S. does, however, allow the import of processed hemp. We here at Cannabis Planet applaud the effort of the Canadian government and their private industry partners. But we can't help but question the wisdom of our own government, for continuing to prohibit cannabis, particularly in these trying financial times. This amazing plant can be used as a food, fuel, fiber, and medicine. It creates new jobs, promotes industry, and generates new tax revenues. It's time for the politicians in Washington to wake up and smell the, well, you know where I'm going with this. For Cannabis Planet, I'm Pat Finnerty. Now make it a great evening. Whoa that I do with my lips. What the f- oh, okay. I'm so old, I'm missing some teeth. I'm so old, I don't remember making this beat. I'm so old, I still listen to cassettes. I'm so old, I still say fresh and deaf. I'm so old, how old am I? I was getting drunk and huffing and getting high when cats like T-Pain and Lil Wayne were shitting in their diapers. 
I was chilling in the cypher. I'm so old, hip hop passed me by. I'm so old, can't listen to jam at 94.5. I'm so old that the records I think are cool are looked at with laughter, kids, this the old school. I'm so old that the old school to me is records from the 70s, not 2003. I'm so old, I still pop and lock, and the kids look at me like, what? what? Here's the thing everybody knows is true, but modern day rappers can't seem to get through to the young brains of their whack ass crew. Yeah, I'm old, but I'm doper than you. Here's the thing record labels all do Sign a teenager, drop him when he's 22 But I got longevity that definitely prove Yeah, I'm old, but I'm doper than you I'm Yeah, so I'm old, but I'm doper than you That is D-Tension no with I'm, I'm So Old, old. Like One of our Groovin' Thursday today. tunes still Also the kind of tune you, you might find so on Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink Every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Pacific Time We got a big library, over 50 episodes we are rerunning While Big Daddy Fink is on high eight is taking a little break for the summertime as is well deserved after almost two solid seasons of the funky roller rink that's awesome man so uh we will see big daddy fink in seattle at the seattle hemp fest we'll be bringing you coverage there from dab central they're uh the booth with oil slick happy daddy handmade apparel clay gooding and us 420 radio so check that out uh, uh august 16th 14th, 15th, 16th, I believe, are the days. It's the third weekend in August. All right. Uh, one quick story before we make it out of the second hour here. America, we got some work to do. A new study indicates that Australia may have the strongest and potentially most dangerous marijuana available. That's right. Australia may have the strongest, most dangerous marijuana available. Uh, Australia's marijuana strength has been uh, measured by its THC content. Uh, The level has been steadily increasing in marijuana over the past 10 years. Data indicates that in America, marijuana contained an average of 3% THC uh, in the early... What's that? 3% THC in 1993. (laughs) Yeah, when Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre dropped doggy style, you know, smoking gin and juice, all that, 1993. Yeah, it was only 3% THC. (laughs) Right. Uh, While in 2008, THC levels nearly tripled to 9%. However, this isn't even close to the THC levels in Australia. A new study by the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center indicates that Australian marijuana is by far the strongest in the world. In measures of THC content, much of the marijuana seized from people on the streets there contains an average of 15% THC and can go as high as 40% THC. The use of such high levels of THC can force users to suffer serious adverse events. These events include seizures, dependence, and even anxiety. In fact, the use of marijuana with such high THC levels ends up undoing the drug's therapeutic effects. Experts, according to the Sydney Morning Herald, feel that more than 15% of THC should be considered an illicit substance as the adverse effects can be likened to the negative effects of controlled and illegal drugs like cocaine. Right. Meanwhile, here's this Marinol pill. It's 100% synthetic THC with absolutely no antipsychotic CBD. And once you understand how this may affect you, uh, go ahead and feel, go ahead and drive. It's okay to drive and operate heavy machinery. Once you understand how the 100% THC pill made from synthetic THC that has no antipsychotic CBD with it may affect you. But if you're smoking that Australian wacky tobacco at 15%, well, my God, my God, you, it, it, terrible effects could happen it's hogwash by the way the american weed is far stronger <laughs> than the three percent 93 or the nine percent they're saying here you got to remember these figures include all of the mexican brick weed that they seize as well and the poorly grown plants that the dumbasses who get caught are, are growing has nothing to do with what the real marijuana consumer is consuming I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Viper Hour is next. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com.